hey, it's going to be a great day. Let me make you aware of a couple of things today. This Wednesday night, any men in the room, we have a men's Bible study that meets the third, uh, fourth Wednesday. What is it? The fourth Wednesday night of every month. And uh, it's this Wednesday night, 6.30. We'd love to have any men in the room. Pastor Steve will be sharing. It'll be a great time to connect, hang out with other men. Great opportunity. 6.30 in our volunteer room. Come join us for that. Also, we're getting ready to go into a season of prayer and fasting. And I'll talk to you about that next Sunday as a church. But we're just believing that God is calling us into this season um, as we gear up for Easter. And I'm going to share that with you next week. But we're going to have a night of worship and prayer on Wednesday night, April 3rd. Wednesday night, April 3rd. That's generally when we have our family parties. We're going to have a night of worship and prayer that night instead. Right here at the church at 630, our worship team will be leading us in the presence of God. They did an incredible job today. They're going to lead us there Wednesday night, April 3rd. So mark that on your calendar. Great opportunity to come and just worship the Lord and we'll pray over needs. It's a big thing. We're going to pray over your friends and family that don't know Jesus. And we're believing that this Easter they're coming home. And they're going to find Jesus. And we're going to pray and believe for them this month. And then one more announcement that I want to make today. You guys all know that 2019, Tasha and I felt that this was our year of health. That the Lord told us that this would be the year of health. And we're pursuing that. And we're chasing after that. And we've been putting things in place, even as a family, as I know many of you have. Putting place things in this church to get healthy. And one of the things that I have personally wrestled with for several weeks um, was three services. I've wrestled with that for quite some time. Um, and I began to pray about it in our scripture for the year that we've been leaning into is Third John verse 2 that says, Dear friend, I hope all is well with you and that you're healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. And we want us to be healthy in our bodies, but one of the big things we want is you to be healthy in your spirit. And so one of the things that Tosh and I, we discussed, we went to some of our volunteers and some of our staff, and we said, hey, we're struggling with three services for two reasons. One, the health of our volunteers, the health of your bodies, the health of our team. Um, one of our volunteer, uh, many of our volunteers, they're here, they get here at 6, 6.30 in the morning, and they're here till 1, 1.30, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and just working, and we're just beginning to think of them, and we want to do something for them. But the biggest thing that the Lord really was putting in my heart is, Chad, I want you to make room for me in your services. And with three services, 8, 30, 10, and 11, 30, it is very difficult to make room for the presence of God to walk into the room. Even as a communicator, you're sitting there and you're watching that clock and you can hear the Lord whisper to you, hey, I want you to say this. I want you to speak this prophetically. And you're like, God, I'll have to catch that later because I got five minutes left in this service, you know, and I got to bring a whole new group of people in. And so we've wrestled with that. And we are going back starting next Sunday. We're going to go back to two services. We're gonna, and, I, and I've not had one person say, oh, dang it, you know. Most of you have went, hey, you know, it's like, like okay, uh, you know, and the big smile comes across your face. We're going to three, we're going to two services, 9 and 1045, and it's for two reasons, so we can be healthy in our body and healthy in our spirit as a church. And that's why we're doing it, 9 and 1045, so you can pick the service you want to hang in. Um, they're going to be crowded. Get here early, but we're going to see the presence of God show up. We're going to get healthy in body and spirit. And I told the Lord this, God, if this is what you want us to do and you want us to get healthy in body and spirit, it's going to be crowded in here, so you're going to have to make us get healthy with land and give us a place to build. And I mean, I believe that he's going to do that for us, all right? All right, is everybody okay with that? Hey, we have an incredible opportunity to have great friends with us today. Um, Paul and I met several years ago. Um, doing some things with Africa, Paul and his wife Andy, pastored Liberty Church in New York, and they were a part of things that we were also doing in Zimbabwe. We were part of this kind of this Zimbabwe family that was doing things. We were in Halmai, and they were in Southtown. Um, Southtown is the church I was preaching at that many of you might have been at with me one time. When we were preaching there, a demon-possessed lady got set free in the middle of the message, screamed, and and the demon left, and she got saved at the end of service, and that was their campus. And um, they, like us, they're no longer in Zimbabwe due to some things out of our control. And they're now um, have a campus, also a community in Southtown, uh, I mean in Swaziland, um, South Africa. They've actually changed the name of Swaziland. I don't even know what the name, Eswatini, they changed the name of it. You can change the name of a country, all right? So we can go to two services if you can change the name of a country, <laughs> all right? But anyway, so they changed the name to Eswatini. And they have a community there, but they're killing it in New York and in San Francisco and in other places. 
And he, he communicated the, one of the most amazing words I personally have heard as a pastor and as a leader in first service. And you're going to be truly, truly blessed. Would you do me a favor and welcome to our stage, Paul Andrews. Well, good morning, church. I guess the Swaziland is one of the last absolute monarchies on earth. And so you can do whatever you want when you're the king. And he was concerned that Swaziland was getting confused with Switzerland. Apparently is the reason why they changed it. You can see how similar they are. Um, and uh, well, we're having a good time down there in Africa, and God's doing amazing things in and through our church. We moved to New York City 2010, and, uh, and you know, like you guys, connected with the Ark, the Association of Related Churches, and they've helped us uh, plant a bunch of times things. But I, so I, I just want to bring you good reports. God is moving in New York City. Anybody glad that God is moving in New York City? I look very serious in that photo, don't I? I look like an assassin or something. I don't know. I need, a, I need a smiling photo that I send out to people. I think we've got a photo of my family as well, if we could maybe put that up on the screen. Andy, if you were at Embrace, Andy showed this family. Sam, always the ham of every photo. It doesn't matter what we do. Sam's always going to draw attention. We've got four kids living in the heart of downtown Brooklyn right there in New York City. By the way, you might as well have four heads as have four kids living in New York. It's that unusual uh, because... People, people say, oh, do you have kids? Okay, yeah, yeah, we have four. And it's always awkward. People are like, oh, wow. You know, they don't know what to say next. Like, you know what causes that, right? Or you guys need a television or something. There's always something because it's basically just us and the Hasidic Jews that have multiple children in New York. But we love the city. We love what God's doing. We love your pastors. Who loves your pastors? <laughs> Chad and Tasha, thank you for having us. And, all that happened through Embrace is amazing. What God's doing through Destiny is incredible. And I just believe the greatest days are right in front of you. And I think, what better thing? Isn't it reassuring to have pastors that are leaning in not only to, not only to more, amen, to more, but leaning into health? Because health is always going to lead, what, to more, amen? So I just celebrate what God is doing here and the season that you're in. And I think I've got a word in season for you as a church. We talk, often talk in sort of ministry, pastoral circles, in church circles, we talk about, let's change the world. And that's a good aspiration. How many think the world needs changing? Anyone else? But we often stop short of talking about, how do you actually change the world? I mean, what is that? That's a noble aspiration. Now, how do you change the world? And the, the, the word I want to bring you this morning, I hope, would just be life to your soul, because I want to show you through a character that is very rarely preached on in the Bible, how we can actually, and I don't believe this is hyperbole, this is not exaggeration, how you can change the world, how you can shape the future, how you can impact generations by something, listen, that every one of us can do. Because we so easily, when we hear change the world, we dismiss ourselves, we assume it's for somebody else. But I want to show you in Acts chapter 4 this morning how this is something every one of us can do. Acts 4 verse 36 says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought it, the money and put it at the apostles' feet. It says here, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas. I want to speak to you this morning about being a Barnabas. A lot of times the Bible doesn't explain what the, name, the names mean. And if you study some of these Beautiful Hebrew names are rich with meaning. So to me, it's significant that the Bible wants us to know what his name meant. The Bible pauses to say, you know, the apostles gave him, he had a good birth name. Joseph's a good, strong Jewish name. But the apostles saw fit to give him a different name. And actually, you know, he goes on to be mentioned a lot through the Bible, but this is the first and the last time he has ever called Joseph. Seems to me the nickname stuck, and the Bible wants you to know that although he was born with one name, he earned another name. The apostles called him the son of encouragement. I believe we are all called to be a Barnabas at a time of massive upheaval in the early church. I mean, think about it. It's one thing to be an encourager in good times, but these are times when the church is being persecuted. Christians are being fed to the lions and thrown into prison. The followers of the way are, you know, terrified, running for their lives. And in the midst of these times of upheaval, here's Barnabas who has built his ministry, literally earned his name through the ministry of encouragement. I believe it's a really powerful calling. 
to be an encourager, and it's something every one of us can do, amen? I don't know about you, but I can look back on my life and ministry and think about marriage or parenting, I can think of people who were a powerful encourager to me. I bet you can too. You know, one of those people, when I, when I first gave my life to Jesus as a 16-year-old, you know, one of the first people in my life was a, a lady at the time she wasn't married, Christine Karyophilus, good Greek name. Actually, she just called herself Christine Alphabet because nobody could spell it. <laughs> True story. And Christine Karyophilus, you know, she got married later, and today she preaches all around the world. Christine Kane is a pretty dynamic woman, started A21 to fight human trafficking and propel women to push the next uh, generation of women in the kingdom forward. But Christine, she, now when I say I, I want to share her as an example, because she's not a fluffy person. You know, if you've ever heard her ministry, you'll know she is like straight, you know, she is, she's a direct alpha type of leader. So oftentimes her encouragement looked like this, right? Got a few slaps around the head from time to time, usually earn them. Uh, but you know, the truth is she was an encourager in my life and called out, saw in me things I couldn't see in myself, believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. In fact, one time she saw me encouraging a young guy I was discipling, and she says to me, Paul, sheep go where they're fed. I was like, okay, so explain that to me. I'm like, you know the disciples, so many times Jesus teaches something, and then he has a side huddle. They're like, what? You know, that was me with Christine. I'm like, teach, what does that mean? Sheep go where they're fed. And, and she, says, she says, if you are an encourager, you will never be short of people to lead. I just determined I'm going to be that kind of a leader. I want to be an encourager because let's face it, there is already more than enough discouragement in the world. Can I get an amen? I mean, sometimes you just got to spend five minutes on Instagram or reading the news and you need a nap, right? There's a lot of discouragement out there. But shouldn't the, ch the church, shouldn't the house of God be the last place on earth that's full of cynics and critics and judgment and negativity? Now, it doesn't mean from time to time that encouragement doesn't look like a bit of loving correction or truth in love. But amen, the spirit of it is encouraging the potential of God in others. Now, I said before, I believe Barnabas changed the world, and I want to show it to you. I, it's right here in the scripture, that through his ministry of encouragement, I believe he was the single most important human being on this earth in the life of a young man called Saul, who goes on to famously become the Apostle Paul. You know, Saul had been part of kind of the religious elite of the day, the Pharisees and they knew the law, and they added 400 plus laws to it, and they knew all of this stuff, but they didn't recognize Jesus. In fact, they crucified the Messiah they'd been waiting for for generations. And so Saul was among them. In fact, the very first martyr, first one killed for being a follower of the faith, Stephen, the Bible notes that Saul was there. He was running the cloakroom, holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen to death, approving, the Bible adds, of his death. And then it's like he gets the fire in his belly. And he goes out, he be becomes famous for all the wrong reasons, infamous, I guess, for persecuting the church. And he's dragging them before the authorities. And people know his name, but they're terrified of him. And, and so in his zeal, he's persecuting the church. In fact, he's on his way. He has letters in his hand. I guess he runs out of people to persecute in Jerusalem. So he says, I'm going to widen the net. And he goes to Damascus with letters to drag the believers there before the authorities, facing likely prison or even death. And it's on his way there that God encounters him. Isn't that counterintuitive? Don't you love the love and, of, and the grace of God that even on his way to persecute <laughs> those who followed his son that had just died and risen again, God meets him there. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So he's radically converted, struck blind, ends up in the house of a man called Ananias. And we're going to pick up Saul's story right there after this radical conversion in Acts chapter 9. In verse 19, it says, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus, and at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Just pause for a second. We'll get back to the Scripture. Can we please read the Scripture by, you know, opening our hearts and minds? I like to put myself in the story. I'm like, okay, you know, this, you know we read it just like a textbook sometimes. Like, no, 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 no. If you're in the church, if you were in Destiny Church, Damascus, this is a tough week because You've heard this guy is on his way. He's going to drag us before the authorities. We might lose loved ones to the lions. 
But then you hear, you know, you get the Instagram feed. It's like he's preaching this weekend. What? You know, this is what's happened. I mean, it says at once he begins preaching. Everyone's like, did he do like next steps? Does he, anyone run a background check? Are we so desperate for preachers that we've got the guy that was killing us last week on the roster, right? I mean, uh, is it just me that reads the Bible like this? I mean, put, this is a hairpin turn at 100 miles an hour. This is what this is. It says all who heard him were astonished. No kidding. <laughs> And ask, isn't this the man that raised havoc in Jerusalem among all those who call on his name? Hasn't he come here to take as prisoners those to the chief priests? And and yet it says Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. And after many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. Ah, ministry. Great. Uh, But Saul learned of their plan, and day and night they kept a close watch on him at the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night, lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. So as he came to Jerusalem, so they, all right, it's it's, it's getting dangerous out here. We'll send him to headquarters. How's that going to go? Down to Jerusalem. It says he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. Now, we read with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, and we think, oh, come on, guys, this is Paul in the making. I mean, he's going to be one of the greats of the early church. They don't know that. Cut him some slack. All they know is he's killing people. He hated us a minute ago. And they're thinking, I'm not sure he's really a disciple. And actually, that would have been a, a clever plan. If many people through persecution have gone underground, what better way to lure them out into the open than to pretend to follow Jesus, like double agent style, and then turn on them and identify them through the authorities. They had good reason. That's what I'm saying. They had good reason to be skeptical, to be afraid. But then two of my favorite words in the whole Bible. It says they were not believing he was really a disciple. Verse 27, listen. But Barnabas. I, I want to submit to you, I've really meditated on this thought. I think this could be the pivot point. This could be the hinge of the New Testament. Those two words. I think everything changes in this moment when people, for good reason, were going to reject Saul, perhaps push him away. Who knows that we would have even had all of these churches? Who knows that these letters would have been written to them that we call the Bible today if there hadn't have been a but Barnabas moment? It says, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. And he he talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. It's like a recurring theme. Three paragraphs, two assassination attempts. It's off to a great start. And when the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. They sent him home. I don't know if the Bible's trying to be funny, and I might be reading too much into this, but the next bit makes me giggle. So they send Saul away, and then the Bible feels it's necessary to add, and then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. (laughs) Is that supposed to be funny? It reads funny to me. And they were strengthened, living in the fear of encouraged by the Holy Spirit, the fear of the Lord, encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. Think about the fruit of Barnabas' life. In this young man, Saul, who would go on to become Paul, we know today as the Apostle Paul, one of the greats of the New Testament, one of the pioneers of the early church. And I wonder, would it even have come to pass if Barnabas hadn't have believed in him when others didn't? So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions in the message here this morning for us to reflect on how this meets us here and now today, because I think this has application for you. This is not just a, a Bible historical character study that we're doing. This is confronting for me because one of the questions we need to ask ourselves is, can I see the work of God in another person's life? Can I? Apparently Barnabas could, when just about everybody else couldn't. He could see the work of God in a person's life. I believe you and I are called to see people, this is important, to see people according to their God-given potential. But so often what we do is we just see people as they are, or worse, we see people according to their past, as as if it's not under the blood of Jesus, amen? No condemnation, a new creation. We so often hold people to the past, or at best we see them as they are, and yet 
So I believe that Barnabas, the gift of a Barnabas to mine in the eyes of Christ and you and I is to see people by the eyes of faith what God is doing in another person's life. Here's another question. Am I willing to risk my reputation on someone else? Because of course, I mean, being an encourager, if I said, who wants to be an encourager? Yeah, we all do. But where the rubber hits the road, this is the real stuff. Because think about it. We know something of Barnabas and his influence. And, you know, he was known to them. They gave him a nickname. He, he, he'd given the proceeds of land. And, and here's Barnabas, who has apparently enough influence and access to be able to get Saul when everybody else is like, I don't know. He got him before the apostles. And he vouched for him. It says that he told them about his conversion. He told them how he preached fearlessly, and they believed him. In other words, he risked his reputation on this young man, Saul. He took a chance. Are we, are we willing to do that? I'd rather err on the side of believing in people, amen, than always the cynic, always the critic. Oh, let them prove ourselves. We'll see. Give them time. And I understand there's wisdom, and there's fruit, and there's a journey, but... Man, if I'm going to err, I want to err on the side of believing in people. Here's another question. Am I willing to handle the ups and downs of believing in people? I mean, Saul nearly got himself killed twice. I imagine that early on, when people like how, saying to Barnabas, how's Saul doing? A good week would have been, he's alive. You know, I mean, that's what it was like in the beginning, right? It's volatile, what the Bible calls it, new wine, right? I mean, it's like, what Saul's doing and what he's wrestling through and revelation in his zeal. It's like he's gone from zeal against the church to zeal for the things of God. And Barnabas had to be willing to navigate the ups and downs of that and the, and the journey of that. Here's another question. Am I secure enough to empower others? This is where we really break down a lot of times. Am I secure enough to empower others? Because it preaches well, and we mean it, we say, we want the next generation to stand on our shoulders. How are we when they actually do, though? How are we when the spotlight shifts? When others are celebrating them, and I'm like, hey, you know, me, I was, I was there. They wouldn't be what they are without me. Am I secure enough? You know, the Bible does an interesting thing. You know, Barnabas and Saul, they spent a lot of time together. They listed a lot of times in the, in the Bible, and early on, it's always Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. Then it's Barnabas and Paul, as his name changes, Barnabas and Paul. And then with no announcement, it just becomes Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas. And you think, well, what does that mean? I'll tell you what I think it means. Paul becomes the more famous of the two. He becomes the so-called bigger name, at least on earth. I think we'll all be shocked when we get to heaven. <laughs> Amen? It's where the impact really was. But that's Barnabas is secure enough to let others shine. Amen? To let others be used by God in ways and to see the spotlight shift as Paul goes on to help plant all these churches and writes much of the New Testament. I imagine Barnabas is just sitting back and smiling as he sees the goodness of God at, life in his, at work in his life. And, you know, I want to clarify something too, because when I say encouragement, I think we all run a filter that we don't realize is there. If I said to you, I think it would be a good idea, go encourage someone today. 99% of us are thinking, I've got to say something. Can I offer a bigger definition of encouragement? If to encourage is simply to put courage in, then let's consider that both words and works are a part of encouragement. Amen to the words. I'm not saying don't use words. But I think Barnabas encouraged just by his presence. Just by being there with Saul, his very presence was encouraging. You know, if you think about it, it was works that got him the nickname. It wasn't words says that he sold a field, brought the proceeds before the apostles, and they gave him the name Son of Encouragement. So it's our time, it's our talent, it's our treasure. Being generous with all that we are is what it means to live a generous, encouraging life. It's not just about words. In fact, if I could say this, I think oftentimes historically the church has majored on words and mitered on works. And it often undermines our witness that our words and our works aren't quite aligned, amen? The world is looking on at the way that we live and what we actually do with what we believe. Let's be people who live as encouragers. And, you know, in case any of you are thinking, well, that's great, but this is just one example. I mean, Barnabas and, and, and Saul, he goes on to become Paul, but actually there's sort of a, a more hidden story in the Bible. In fact, I didn't realize until I studied for this message that, that Barnabas has a cousin, 
John Mark, the Bible often just calls him Mark for short, and you have to piece it together because it's not told all in one place in the Bible. As you read through the different letters and you read through the book of Acts, we come to discover that, that Barnabas and, and Saul, when they went out to plant all those early churches, they decided to bring Barnabas' cousin John Mark with them. Now, we don't know why, and we don't know exactly when, but somewhere through that trip, as they planted churches in Ephesus and Corinth and somewhere along the way, John Mark quit. Like he literally just turns back. So they finish the trip without him, and sometime later they decide, we've got to go back out and encourage all those churches again. And Barnabas says, let's bring John Mark, and Paul says, no. He says, no. In fact, in fact, the Bible says, he deserted us. That's how Paul said, he deserted us. He's a deserter. He's not coming on. Paul wouldn't even take him on a mission trip. He deserted us. The Bible says it was such a sharp dispute that Paul and Barnabas go different ways. And from then on, it's always Paul and Silas, and it's Barnabas and Mark. And you would think that's going to be the end of the story. And in some ways, as you read it and Paul writing so much of the story, you could miss that what's beautiful about encouragement is encouragement creates room for second chances. It's not the end of the story for Barnabas. It's not the end of the story for Mark. I haven't got time to read you the scriptures, but let me say this. Is it's not the end of it because Paul, in some of his letters, think the last thing he called this guy is a deserter and refused to take him on a mission trip. But in Philemon 124, he, he, he honors Mark by saying he is my fellow worker in Christ. Well, that's a big step up on deserter. And by the time we get to 2 Timothy chapter 4, he actually says, send John Mark to me, for he is useful to me in my ministry. You know, many scholars believe this is the very Mark that wrote the gospel of Mark. Hello? And it makes me wonder, Paul, and all honor to Paul, and, but he was ready to split ways with Barnabas. He was done. But I can, I, can, I can wager that by the end of his life, as he's writing these letters, he thinks, I'm so glad there was a Barnabas. For this young guy, I wouldn't even take on a mission trip. He ends up writing one of the Gospels, hello, and being useful to Paul in his ministry. That's what encouragement does. What surprised me as I was looking at this is that Bible offers him, one of the translations I read, there's an alternate translation for his name. It, a little asterisk, and down the bottom it says, can also be translated son of prophecy. And I was going to sort of leave that to the side because I was on this whole thread of encouragement. I was like, oh, wait, how can that be? How can it be both encouragement and prophecy? You know what I came to realize? In the New Testament, these are two sides of one coin. Every time you encourage someone, do you know what you're doing? You're prophesying. And you know, in the New Testament, New Testament prophecy, the spirit of it is encouragement. 1 Corinthians 14, 3. The one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. There they are, right together. We so often uh, imagine kind of some really scary version of prophecy. And here it is. The Bible says, no, it's for strengthening. It's for encouraging. And it's for comfort. Every time you, you uh, prophesy, you encourage. Every time you encourage, you prophesy. See, um, I, I love the word champion. And our culture loves the word champion, but we forget that it's both a noun and a verb. You know, we, we love the idea of being a champion. Champion, the noun, I want to be a champion. And I, 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 amen to that. By all means, live a life that's inspiring and live a life of example that would call others to be all they can be in God. I think that's great. That's a, that's a noble aspiration. But we forget, champion's also a verb. I don't just want to be a champion. I want to champion others. I want to champion the potential in somebody else and be so secure enough in who God has called me to be to be able to amen and call out the greatness in others around me. In fact, Bob Buford, who passed away last year, he famously said, my fruit grows on other people's trees. Well, that's the, that's the life of a, of a Barnabas right there. Amen? My fruit grows on other people's trees. Jesus like the ultimate hero maker, he says in John 14, verse 12, he says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I've been doing. Listen to this, for audacity, I love it. And they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. That's Barnabas talk right there. Even greater things than these. And maybe you're sitting here today and you think, that's great, but honestly... 
I need encouragement right now. I mean, yeah, maybe in a different season I could be more encouraging, but honestly right now you don't know what I'm going through. And, and you're right, I don't. And, and I'm not trying to minimize your pain. That's, leg- that's a legitimate need that you're speaking to right there. But can I offer a reframe, a different way of thinking about where you are right now? You know, the Bible says that he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. The Bible talks about this principle of sowing and reaping. Gandhi famously said, be the change you want to see in the world. Scripture talks about if you, if you want to have friends, show yourself to be friendly. In other words, this is what I would offer to you. If you find yourself in a season where you wish the atmosphere around you was more encouraging than it is right now, can I encourage you to take this opportunity to be what you want to experience, to sow what it is that you hope to reap because God is faithful to his word. I'm going to get the worship team to come join me, and I want to... We're going to worship in a moment. I want to pray for you because I actually really believe that God is, in fact, calling people in this room to step into this message and do something about it. To be not only hearers of the word, as Jane puts it, but doers also. You know, as we were getting ready to leave Australia, it had you know, been my home church 20 years and sown a lot of seed. And one of the last services there, a young guy, Kieran, came up to me. He knew we were moving to New York and he mightn't see me again. And he says, I've still got your card. I still got your card up on my wall. And I had one of those awkward moments. Have you ever had the awkward moment when you don't know what the other person's talking about? And it's clearly important to them, and you really want to remember, but you don't. And I've got a hopeless poker face. So he could tell right away, it's like, you don't know what I'm talking about. I'm embarrassed. I was like, the note. Oh, yeah, the note. Don't remember. Uh, And he says, it's okay. You wouldn't remember it was over 10 years ago. I said, okay, so refresh my memory. He says, you know, when I was in high school, you wrote me a note and you, you said, you know, I, I see the call of God in your life and you're going to be a man of God, a man of integrity. And he said, it so encouraged me that I, I got a cork board on my wall and I pinned it up on it. It's been there ever since. Now, bear in mind, he was a high school student at the time. He went on to finish high school. He goes to college, finishes his degree, go, goes out, becomes a very successful realtor, gets married, three kids. <laughs> And there's still that note up on his wall, amen? Still the note up on his wall. And you know why that speaks to me? It just speaks about the power of encouragement, church. You and I are called to do this. You and I are called to be this. And for a moment, I was embarrassed, thinking, I can't believe I don't even remember the note. And then I started to realize that's the power of being a Barnabas, is you're not always going to know. In fact, if you make a lifestyle of being an encourager, it's kind of like how the scripture says that a a farmer goes out to sow seed, not knowing whether this one or that will prosper. And you'll have these glorious days that'll encourage you in the days of toil and believing, and maybe even the disappointments and the setbacks when you see, man, that one made a difference. We're all called to be this, church. We're all called to be this. And we're going we're gonna to worship in a minute. I just have a great sense, listen, I have a great sense that there are people, it's not even just, you know, I'm not just thinking about you right now. You know who I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about who you know. Because there are people that you can reach and there are people that trust you. There are people that you have a voice into that are hurting right now. And heaven help us if the church ever becomes about ourselves. I think it was William Tyndale who said the church exists for those outside it. So this morning, there's somebody here who's got a lifeline into somebody whose marriage is struggling, whose finances are on the edge, whose kids are falling apart, who's walked away from Jesus, who used to be here in this room, and they're hurting out there right now. And we say, oh, the church should do something. Okay, but we are the church. What do we mean, the church? We are the church. We don't just go to church. We are the church. So yeah, let's do something. Let's do it today. Maybe we could text somebody, set up a lunch with somebody, get our families together. I don't know what it is. All I know is, all I know is, God can use you to help rewrite somebody's story. Because I bet when Barnabas was encouraging Saul, he had no idea. Even on his most optimistic day, would he have thought this guy will plant all these churches thousands of years from now, people will be reading and preaching his word? Probably not. Come on, let's stand. We're going to worship in just a second, but I have a sense that there are people today who are going to answer this call. Make this choice. God, use me. Because it's not about introverts and extroverts. It's not about how long you follow Jesus. 
It's not about an age thing. It's something every one of us can do. Young people in the room, you can do this. And you can shape the future if you are determined by the grace of God to be an encourager. If this is you this morning, if this word resonates with you, what I mean by that is, let me clarify. Not just I like that message, but let me push you further. I am going to do something about it. Would you raise a hand or both hands toward heaven? Allow me to pray over you before we worship here today. God, let this become the very culture of our lives. God, let this become a defining hallmark of our following of Jesus. Is that we would be encouragers of the goodness of God and the purpose and potential of God in others around us. God, let it be written in the history books, whether our names are ever seen or known. Not like Bob Buford said, let our fruit grow on other people's trees. God, call to our remembrance and put in our hearts today those that right now need a Barnabas to speak the words of life, to be a true friend, to love unconditionally, without agenda, those in the world around us and love them back to the very purpose and potential of God. God, use us in our day to make a difference we could never have imagined. Shape generations, shape nations, and let the heavens be filled with those. God, the fruit of our lips, the output of our lives, the power of encouragement, I pray it in Jesus. Beautiful name, and everybody said this morning, come on, amen, amen. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name. And I just want to speak. dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus, your name.
great message. What a great word. Let's give it up for Paul. Wasn't that an amazing word today?